you jib a jab. Bamboos on new canoes on pippity pop she called. You jib a jab. Bamboos on new canoes on pippity pop she called. I mean, you keep on talking, but you don't know where to turn. Hi, I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute. <sighs> You're watching Independent Thinking. So, you ready to have the government take your home? We're going to take a closer look at this, and not just a problem in Colorado, but around the nation. Eminent domain. Of course, you've seen her. You love her. She sat in for me many times. Jessica Corey from the Independence Institute runs our uh, property rights project. Thanks for having me, John. And we've been enjoying a new movie from a new batch of, of directors, including this man, Philip Klein, who did a great movie called Begging for Billionaires. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Is it true that you do the voice for Christopher uh, Chris on, on Family Guy? No. Are you sure? No. Can, can we go with people, that? Yeah, people accuse me of that, but no. I think you do. No. I think I think I'd, I'd roll with that. It's an I think, honor in this part of the country. Yeah, I, th I, th I think you can get women that way. I, I'm, <laughs> no. I'm just thinking okay. That. Then, then I, I okay. I, All right. What definitely. reason for making a movie? Why? Well, it's uh, I had a couple friends that basically, for the last 40 years, who've been under condemnation of imminent domain, and I cited the document, um, the next round, because the first time they tried to do a redevelopment project in um, Kansas City, Missouri, in their area, uh, it basically collapsed. And then it basically they were trying another entertainment district, and I decided to follow their story. Then I found out that Missouri from the <coughs> Institute of Justice, uh, IJ, co considered Missouri one of the worst states in the nation at the time. I decided to do the whole state of Missouri and follow five families from Kansas City, a few in Kansas City, and a few in St. Louis. And we tell their story of them being threatened by eminent domain and going through the process where they lose their property. We even covered the other side and some of the outrageous things that Whitney Kerr says and some of the other people Who's say. Whitney Kerr? Whitney Kerr is a, a collector of property for the city. He runs a company that basically puts the parcels together. He's kind of the strong man uh, who forces the people to f sell out. How, how does that happen? I mean, I, I mean, we, we know what eminent domain is. Here in Colorado, we've got some laws that protect us from eminent domain, but still, as you've seen through the RTD condemnations that are going on, what's happened in Aspen and other places, that government can reach into somebody's life, take their property, and it is constitutional to pull it out and give it to another private party. This is the great Kelo decision. Uh, uh, and it's one of, those, one of those things you don't even think about until it happens to someone like you or someone you love. I mean, this is a problem you don't even think about until it touches you, and it can touch you like that. Exactly. Well, under our Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, we are guaranteed a right to own our property without government interference unless it is necessary for a public good or a public interest and upon such a need being demonstrated by the government that we are fairly compensated. That sounds fine and good, but what we've seen in this country over the last two centuries is that that right, that protection, is being gradually eroded. And fortunately in Colorado, after the Kelo decision, which I'm sure we'll get into, which allowed governments to take property merely because they believed, not because they could prove, but because they believed that transferring that property's ownership to another property developer or owner could have the possibility of generating more tax revenue. That caused incredible outrage in Colorado and 42 other states. We were one of those 42 states that passed significant reforms. That being said, we have a lot of work to do to ensure that all pro property owners for the, for are For those protected. folks who just don't quite understand this idea, the idea of eminent domain is and it's a good idea. We need roads, we need sewer lines, we need power lines, and sometimes it's got to go through private property. And that's why we have a constitutional method for government to say, I'm sorry, we're widening the street, it means we're taking your property, you, there's, we're going to put a school in here, we need to take your farmland to do it. I could make it easier for the people to understand that the four and a half years that I took to make this documentary it's, is what um, now Mayor Funkhauser at the time, he was city auditor, said it's basically graph. What happens is the developers go to the politicians, either legislature <coughs> or county or your city government, and they say, look, you know, we have this area that we want to condemn. Uh, we'll give you large campaign contributions in your um, next election if you give us this property. So it's one hand washes the other. And uh, in Missouri, what happened was somebody like Mike White and a few other developer lawyers took the law 
as you know, for public use, and they did a little creative financing with it and basically changed it so it could be open to private developers. And it's just been rampant in the state of Missouri, and a lot of states have basically done the same thing, and it's just rampant, and you know, for even a Walmart. And we have had cases involving Walmart condemnations in Colorado, including one that earned front page USA Today coverage. And given that we're all three property rights advocates, I think it's really important to make a couple points because uh, at least in the years that I've run the property rights project, I have been painted as this zealot, this anti-progress um, voice that doesn't believe that we need eminent domain and when in fact I think the vast majority of property rights advocates which include small business owners and working families and even corporate CEOs acknowledge that eminent domain is sometimes necessary and we have to make that sacrifice for the betterment. That does not mean we should open the flood, floodgates to abuses. The other side uh, of it but too. Let me say you there. Isn't, sure. it, isn't it fair to say eminent domain for those of us who believe in property rights, eminent domain we support is for true public use. Yes. Public use means for the public, not for the private. So when Suzette Kilo lost her home so that New London, Connecticut could give it to another private developer to build a hotel, that's wrong. If they took her land because that's where the new school needed to be, or that's where um, the new road needed to be, or the new parkway, or the new bridge, or whatever public use, uh, that government owns, we would have supported that reluctantly, but we understand that's what the idea was meant for. But part of the thing in Kilo, it wasn't just the hotel. They were giving it to uh, the Cerner Corporation, the big um, pharmaceutical, um, who had a big headquarters there. Was that Eli Lilly or no, was Pfizer. That, Pfizer? Pfizer, that's yes. what, I'm sorry, it was Pfizer. Pfizer was part of that. And, and what we've also found is these giant corporations, like in Kansas City, like H&R Block, who is a billion dollar corporation, and, and you know, Walmart, and uh, AMC, theater chain, and just a lot of these big corporations are just hounding uh, for um, uh, Cabela's. That's all Cabela's does is goes around the country saying, yeah, you want a Cabela's, you gotta give me giant tax breaks. And well, this raises a very important point because there's this idea out there that uh, corporations are pro-competition and pro-business and what we have allowed to happen in our society, and by we, I mean all of us, including those corporate CEOs, everybody down to the small business owner or the stay-at-home mom, is that we have allowed our government to become a vehicle to stifle competition. So many of these Walmarts, like they did in my hometown of Arvada, where they came in and encouraged the government to pave over a privately owned lake to put in a Walmart parking lot, not even the Walmart, just the parking lot. They did that through the government. They did that through a process that included uh, public meetings being posted. And it took years and hundreds of thousands of dollars in privately funded litigation to fight back, but we must remain vigilant. Let's remember why this happens. As you mentioned, there are private corporations that look and say, boy, you know, if we could locate our business, our Walmart, our Cabela's, right here, it's close to the highway, we'll get it, we can make a lot of money. And you get the municipality, the municipality wants cash revenues, they want tax revenues. So they're going to see, well, there's, you know, Bob's bait and tackle shop there, and that's nice, but you put in a Walmart, we're going to be flush with money. Of course, we're going to work out a deal with Walmart to, to, to bring them here. And really what that is is corporate welfare. We're going to say, we're not going to give the same breaks to Bob's bait and tackle shop as we're going to give to Walmart because Walmart, we know, is going to give us the cashola. And in fact, that cashola never or almost never comes to fruition because under the current incentive structures that these local governments provide to Walmart so that Walmart will go to Arvada and not Lakewood or the next municipality over, we see that oftentimes the tax benefits and the tax breaks that come in addition to getting the free land uh, to locate their store there that Walmart has it figured out. By the time that their tax breaks are up, sometimes a decade, sometimes more, sometimes less, they've moved on to the next municipality to open a new store. And this is a model utilized not just by Walmart, but by Home Depot and many other corporations.